Welcome in everybody to Unbreakable, a mental wealth podcast today for probably the most meaningful podcast I've ever had in my entire life. And it's a follow-up from a previous podcast of two people who I really look up to, and I think you will as well, when you hear this incredible story. And this today was also about me keeping my promise to two people who are very special to me. But before we get into that, uh, if you're like many people, you may be surprised to learn that one in five adults in this country experienced mental illness last year, yet far too many fail to receive the support they need. Carolyn Behavioral Health is doing something about it. They understand that behavioral health is a key part of whole health, delivering compassionate care that treats physical, mental, emotional, and social needs in tandem. Carolyn Behavioral Health, raising the quality of life through empathy and action. All right, welcome into the Unbreakable Mental Wealth Podcast. Um, so on Veterans Day, I had on two very special people who are sitting here to my left. Shoshana Johnson, who was the first ever black female POW in the history of our military. And Kearney Russell, the Marine, who actually kicked down the door in Iraq to rescue and save her. And back then, they told me they still had not met in person. The wild thing is, I think we think in movies that Man, you get rescued, and man, you guys just keep in touch. But no, Kearney had to, you, Shoshana had to go back, and, and she had to get medical attention. Kearney went back and fought and served for years. So they have not met in person besides that. So I said, I give you my word. I promise you, I will fly you out to meet in person. And here we are 21 years this week from your first week being held captive for 22 days, your first week in captivity, and you guys finally get to meet. First of all, thank you both for joining us. And I'm going to start with you and both of you. Like, what was it like to see this man for the first time that saved your life after 21 years? Um, shocking. I I remember the 18 year old, right? You know, that came through the door. And you have to remember, this is not just 18 years old, but they was it three weeks? Y'all have been pushing through. Oh, yeah. Yeah, three yeah. weeks or so. Yeah, so they looked rough. Days, days. <laughs> <laughs> I looked rough after three weeks in captivity, but they also looked rough because they had been pushing and, and doing these firefights and so forth. Um, so this big strapping man is not what I remember. I remember an 18 year old kid, kind of dusty and dirty, um, serious, very serious for a young man and just getting the job done. Mm -hmm. You know, and I also remember my security blanket. Uh, I felt safe. I felt uh, um, secure when he was right there, you know. So um, it's kind of um, surreal to see <laughs> this this grown strapping man here, father of two, <laughs> you know. Um, but in my head, he's always going to be that 18 year old kid mm -hmm. that has pushed through three work, three weeks of war. Right. You but, you, but, you, but you also. First time again, you've seen a man who saved your, your life. life. Yes. I, I, it's, it's, you know, Kearney, I, th I think Kearney and Castro are the only ones I haven't seen in person since that day. I've seen some of the others, but yet, and I tell them every time, in my head, you're still those young men who came to my rescue. You'll never be... You'll never be old. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is some of them losing their hair. These, these, young, <laughs> these young superheroes are always yes, the young superheroes. That, and that's it. You got it. Mm. Hit the nail on the head. They're going to be always the young superheroes that came through the door. Their shoulders so wide, they had to turn sideways. You know, these you know big lights behind their heads like halos. In my mind, no matter what happens, whatever goes else, goes on in life, that's what I see in my head. And that's how I picture you until my dying day. So what was your reaction when you got to see Shoshana? Because we had you sneak up on her and you know, have a little surprise <laughs> yesterday. What was your reaction? Like, again, this is not you just meeting your high school buddy. This is somebody whose life you've now saved. And she's affected a lot of people. She's lifted people up. She's done speaking, engaged. But by the way, you want to bring her in to speak to your groups. Absolutely. Um, what was it like for you to see this woman that you've been so attached to for 21 years, but still not seen her since you handed her off in Kuwait. Yeah, it was like, uh, for me, it was one of those moments where like the, the image I had of her um, is not who she is today. You know, when we 
first found when we first found her and the six other uh, POWs in captivity. Um, she didn't look the way she looks now. Um, and, and it was just, you know, in, in that moment, I wanted to give her a hug. You know, I wanted to just hug her and like, she is real, you know, here she is, like she is real. Um, I think I gave her two hugs, the second one to confirm like, yeah, this, she is still real. Uh, I was just one of those, it's a real moment, you know, um, something that, you know, it's kind of ranked those moments in your life. And I think this, this one's going to be above the rescue uh, for sure. Wow, really? Seeing you again. Really? Yeah. Cause when, really? when we saw her, you know, seeing you, you know, seeing you the first time, it was kind of like, just, you know, we were doing a job. Like we were mm. thankful and happy to be able to do that and provide that freedom, right. That like get you guys back to safety and, you know, be free again. Um, and then this go around seeing you, it was like, here you are you know it's just a, such a different moment um i said i think it's, it's better than when we first found you like they're reuniting with you um just being able to see you and talk to you this weekend it's been it's, well, it's been amazing that's very sweet I, the first time is better for me because i would have been dead <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean that's that, that's the reality of it by the time they came to rescue us we were in we we're in homes the last two people places we were in were homes and we couldn't hear we couldn't hear the battle going on before we could hear the battle we can hear you know we can hear bombs going off we, you know so that means the u.s is close if they're that's going oh, on okay um there was one place in they we could hear the a-10s or something going over and look the shells could hit the roof that's how close it was so people would think, oh, that's going to be scary. I said, that's a relief because I wow. know the U.S. is close and they can find me. By the time they got to where we were at, I hadn't heard a battle in for quite a few days. So I'm no longer close enough for them to find me, wow. to find any of us. So when they came in shouting in clear English, get down, get down. Oh, my God, I'm going home. Oh, my God, I'm going home. And, and I was just, I, I, it's hard to describe the feeling of not just I'm going home, but it means I'm going to, I'm going to survive. I'm going to live that that's, I'm going to live, you know, you know, and then of course, one of the other things I remember telling y'all that I also meant I had to hold on. I couldn't cry just yet. The men had to cry first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, being a female in the military, you got to hold on and show that tough side. And even being rescued, I was thinking, I, you can't cry. You can't bust you out in tears. You got me crying over here. Like, you can't like, bust out in tears, Shauna. You can't bust out in tears because then you'd be seen as weak. You're still trying to hold on and be wow. that strong one and stuff. But, um, yeah. And then after we asked where we were at, we didn't know where we were at or anything. We were outside of Tikrit, Saddam's um hometown and stuff so we were closer to death than we realized Exp explain that like, to crete um saddam's hometown his stronghold okay. if they had gotten us to to crete there's no way we would have survived there's no way they would have given us up so just to uh kind of put that yeah. into a little more perspective that when we had formed that task force Tripoli to get up to saddam's hometown to to crete because that's where like the last stand was supposed to be. The big fight was supposed to be there. The okay. Revolutionary Guard was supposed to be there. All of his loyalists were supposed to be there. So that was supposed to be the big. That was supposed to be the big fight. Um, so I imagine if they were to make it to the big fight before we did, it wouldn't have been good for them. Really, you. So you literally thought you were a day or two away from yeah being executed. No, Hugh. And then another inkling, the night before. They gave, they fed us dinner and they gave us soda and candy. What is it? Your last meal. You serious? I don't know if that's what they intended, but that's, that's what I thought. Really? I thought, we're in captivity. We've been getting rice, sometimes a piece of chicken and stuff like that. And that was the best meal we've had the entire captivity. So I started to think, I said, they're going to kill us. This is the last meal. And I kept, I didn't say it to the guys right. or anything, but I'm thinking to myself, this is our last meal. They giving us a soda and a piece of chocolate afterwards and stuff like that. And then the next day we get rescued. How do you process that? Going to bed knowing, okay, well, this is my last meal. Tomorrow is my last day. Uh, I really didn't go to bed. You know, we didn't, once we were in that situation, we were all in the same room. We didn't do the whole captivity in the same room. 
Um, what are you saying we? Me and the guys. What got so? It was me and six guys. Six, okay. And then that's the seven American POWs. Yes. Okay. So by then we're all in the same room. So some of us would be sleeping and then others would be up, you know, stuff like that. Nobody was all sleeping at night and nothing like that. It's just, you're so amped up. You don't know what's going on. Wow. So sometimes I would doze off and then I'd like wake up and look around, see who else is up, you know? Hey, but you said, so when did you, how many places did they put you Seven. They, they had you in seven places in 22 seven. days. Seven places in 22 days. And how, like, if you can just describe what the the difference of what there were and because you said you were there were home the last two were homes what were the first five yeah yeah we had prisons jails um the first one was a prison um then there were some jails in there there was one we call lock and leave storage because it was literally uh i would say five by five little cell now i'm five three uh, or, or five by six because I could fit, I could lay down in it. But we had two, uh, um, two of the guys are over six feet, so they couldn't lay down. Oh my god! They had to if. And you're on it together. No, oh, I I know. was by myself, but right. they put the guys two by two by that point. Wow! And they're so wicked. They put the two six feet guys together, wow. in 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 a six by five cell. Wow. So, you know, and then we tried to talk and we're like, oh, who's with who? And I'm like, I'm by myself again. Um, I think that's, but that's actually part of the Geneva Convention. That it was correct. Really? You don't house the females with the males. Okay. Um, one of the things they did do correct. So, <laughs> you know, lock and leave storage because they literally put us in there locked and then walked away. We heard them walk away and we didn't see them for hours and stuff like that. We hadn't eaten you know we had to go to the bathroom you know stuff like that right um then there was another house but the firefight was close because that's the one where i heard the um the yes. shells hitting the roof but the last two places was homes and i heard no battle so they're putting you in civilian homes who yes are, who are obviously supporting saddam's Fight. I'm assuming. Right. I'm assuming because who else is going to walk away from their home and, and have these people in there and then guards? Oh, so the people who own the house, they're not there. They leave. As far as guards. I know, they yeah, okay. there's no. So you only dealt with guards there. Yes. I only oh. dealt with guards. Interesting. And so, again, this is our first reunion, the first time you've seen each other. Um, and, you know, you you shared a great story and a picture with us. That, oh, yeah. Right. This is, I just want the world to hear also, since we've all last spoken, what has happened to your life and your, and your family, um, their reaction to hearing what you actually did. So, yeah, th you know, throughout the years, this story, I, I've never really told the story in its entirety. You know, people who knew about it would ask, you know, kind of questions and I'd, you know, give them an answer to the question or to the story. Um, but this is the first time that I was actually able to tell the story, kind of document the story with Shoshana. Um, so like, my mother and father who both passed, who they have not never heard the story. Mm -hmm. um, so I have sisters who have finally heard the story. My wife finally heard the story. My daughter is my oldest daughter who's 20. So you said um, when we first did our this Unbreakable Mental Wealth podcast, it's the first time they've heard the story. Yes. Yes. Wow. It's the first time that they've heard the full story instead of just the bits and pieces of okay. it. Um, so my oldest daughter was able to hear the story. Uh, one thing that, you know, she I came home that day and, you know, kind of had a tear in her eye and said that she had heard the podcast and gave me a hug. And that like it's when it kind of really sunk in, like, this isn't about me. And, you know, this is a story that needs to be told, you know, um, it not just for my sake, but, you know, people who hear this you know, may inspire them. Right. Um, and also my, I have a three-year-old daughter now, so she was able to, uh, my wife was actually out in that 29 Palms area hiking around, uh, and she was able to take my daughter out to, there's a mural that's painted of Shoshana and myself out there. So my wife sent me a picture of my youngest daughter, who's three years old, looking up at that picture. And it was, uh, it's one of those moments that I had to, you know, put my phone down, then look at it again. And like, it's okay if I get a little teary eyed on that. So it's okay if you get teary eyed on that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful picture. Right? It is a beautiful picture. I sent it out to my Facebook and, and people are just in awe. They were like, 
wow, that is so wonderful that, you know, and it's surreal to see your little girl looking up and saying, like, you know, like, wow, that's my dad. Right. You know, yeah. that's a cool thing. I can't believe he didn't tell his family. I can't. <laughs> Neither could I. Like, I, I, this, I is, this is superhero real life stuff. And I, yeah. And I always say, like, I obviously work with a lot of military. Started a military foundation, MVP, and a lot of things I always say is, guys, you got to, your your stories are your equity. And I know the military says, don't talk about it. But, man, you know, in a life where everybody else lies on their resume, oh, you guys go, don't say anything. And this is your equity. It's your experience. So you should get out there and say, yeah, this is what I did. And be proud of what you've done. Be proud of your scars and be proud of your accomplishments. And now you're seeing that because you're finally able to talk about it and be proud of it, the reaction you have with your 20-year-old daughter. You got emotional yesterday in telling us about that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, uh, go back to one of the questions you had asked earlier, you know, why I think like this moment or this reunion to me, why it's a little it's you know i hold it higher than the rescue day is uh you know i I was never able to really sit with you and talk to you you know so i was able to sit with her talk to her and she's not just shoshana johnson um the pow that you know myself and the marines for uh third light Armored reconnaissance battalion rescued like she's a person Mm -hmm. you know i know her as a person now so i think that makes it like more special you know Mm -hmm. Uh, the, you know, the fact the that then like, she was a mission. Now she's a person. She's a person. Right. right? <laughs> and the fact that like from my oldest to my youngest daughters now, you know, my young, oldest able to hear it, my youngest able to see that it's like, it makes it just that much. It's, it's just a special moment. You know, like this whole thing is special. Like I said, it's, it's above that rescue day for me. I hope um, after this, your kids refer to her as aunt Trishana, <laughs> and your daughter refers to him as uncle Curtis, <laughs> because this is closer than, this is a closer bond than most that, that many are that many are born into. This is different. Right, yeah, yes. I think we spoke yesterday, and I mentioned uh, you know my oldest daughter at the time, my girlfriend, my wife. Now, right, I didn't know yeah. the the sex of our of our daughter because um, she was pregnant during that deployment. So you know everybody throws these big gender reveals now. It's like a new thing right. now. Well, Shoshana was part of my gender reveal because when I got down to Kuwait, you know, because of her and the six others in that that day. I was able to use the phone and find out, you know, the sex of my daughter, who, you know, Maya, who's my oldest. So that's another moment that, you know, we share. Wow. So here's what I want to do now. Because you, um, this is the first time like you're saying you are able to see each other in person. I want to shut up, but I want to let you guys just, I'm going to let you two ask each other questions about things. Like you said, it's the first time you get, <laughs> right? Like you guys, I'm sure, have things that you haven't been able to because you haven't talked to each other in person. So ask each other stuff. And I'm just going to be a fly on the wall with everybody else out there. Yeah, you know, so one question I have is, uh, so we kind of touched on it briefly yesterday. Is like, I, I know what it's like to come off of a deployment, what I would say a regular deployment. You know, you come off of the deployment. It's the the welcome home, right? It's the, if your family's there, it's what you see on TV. They run up, they hug you. Um, for me, coming off the first deployment was kind of depressing. I didn't have any family and, uh, just walking back to the barracks oh. type deal, you know, with my buddies, right? We're walking back to the barracks, kind of asking ourselves, well, what now? Like, what was your homecoming like? Well, mine, mine was kind of spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, because people understand I deployed out of Fort Bliss. Fort Bliss, El Paso is my hometown. Is where my dad retired. Um, I grew up in the area and so forth. So... When we got, after we got rescued, a week later, we're flying into El Paso, my hometown. My my aunts and uncles are there, some of the cousins, my sisters, and so forth. And then the town comes out to support, you know. El Paso is a very big military town, and that's just who they are. So I had all of that there, and then on top of that, I had my family there to support me. And we are a military family. My dad served 21 years. My sister was active duty. I have a great uncle from Vietnam. God God bless him. He's still trucking at 90. I was going to be 93 and stuff like that. So we... We know how to bring it together as a military family, and but we also know the journey. You know, we've done the deployments. We've done the wars and, and so forth. So I had a lot of support. I had my village. And I, I tell people all the time, they're like, oh, you're doing so well. And I said... First of all, you're only seeing a piece of me. You're not seeing the whole story. 
Second, I have a lot of support from my community because I deployed and returned to my community and I have this military family. And I said, and on top of that, you don't see the days that I don't want to get up out of bed. Um, the three hospital stays for suicidal and, and homicidal ideations, um, you know, the going to therapy, the family calling, you know, every other day to make sure that I'm okay. And, um, you know, to make, I'm sorry. Is that your phone? Yes. <laughs> well, I didn't yeah. think it was that damn we'll, loud. That's we'll my niece. That good. Yeah. <laughs> that my, I'm okay. Um, as I was saying, uh, so they don't understand, they don't see all of that in the background. Um, like I said, there are days when I'm I'm laying in yeah. bed and I'm questioning my existence and, and, you know, nine people from my unit died and two others that were attached. So why am I here? How did I get so blessed? Um, uh, you know, I took two bullets to the legs. And although the Iraqis did an operation towards the beginning, by the time I got rescued, um, I hadn't had a bandage change in a while. And, and you know, I had to be rushed to surgery the next morning to um, repair and, you know, worried about infection and stuff like that. So, and I'm here, heels. I right. mean, they gonna hurt tomorrow, <laughs> but, you know, so I, I do, people see a little bit, they don't understand the back struggle and stuff like that. So now my question to you, you've done this like three times. How the fuck you did this? Okay, oh, curse. It's my podcast. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> how the fuck did you do three deployments, man? Uh, yeah, uh, every, every deployment was a little bit different, you know, uh, from the invasion that was, uh, it's quite the experience. So glad that, you know, I was able to be part of an invading force, right. Liberating force. Um, then the second deployment was more of like, uh, we were calling SAS or, um, support and stability operations, uh, trying to restore some government to that, to the, um, to that country. Uh, so that deployment was completely different than the first deployment. Um, fast forward, did a Afghanistan deployment, um, completely different country, completely different war. Um, and then, uh, last deployment was out on, uh, on Navy ship, part of the, uh, the 11th Marine expeditionary unit, kind of just out there, um, in certain areas as a pre-positioned force if needed, but every deployment working up to it, it was different, was hard, you know, a little bit challenging than the other, um, biggest takeaway with that is the time away from family. You know, that's yeah. a time that I'm not going to get back, yeah. but looking back at it, to me, it was all worth it. You know, I, I believed in what we were doing. Um, I just wanted to keep going, keep going with the mission. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, it's the family time that I, that I will never get back. Uh, that's probably one of the hardest things, you know, yeah. the time away from my wife, the time away from my oldest at the time, you know, Gia wasn't born yet, but it was that time away like that was really hard and then coming home off of every deployment is hard again because now here i was off on deployment but you know what what people don't understand is it's not just hey you're going on deployment today it's the year-long workup prior to that so it's all the field ops it's out in the field for a month on it at a time or weeks on it it's the work people don't see that you put in right yes. exactly yeah and then coming home it's almost like or every time coming home it's having to almost reintroduce myself to my family yes you know um let letting my wife know hey i'm here now i can help with that i can take care of that well wow. you know you don't have to reach out for the help that you've been trying to get through friends and things like that like i'm home like that's that's the hard part too is coming back home um, operating at that high level. And then, you know, oh, last week we're in Iraq. This week I'm home. I need to be dad now. Mm. That's that tough transition. You know, that's so tough. Um, and yeah, I just so did what, it, what, did, what, I did what it a advice, few more times. So that I, again, I, I helped a lot of veterans. I've tried to help a lot of veterans um, with transition. What advice would you give? Your fellow vets about those time when you do come home that now you know okay this this helped me a little bit or hey if i knew this this would have helped me then be patient be understanding um let your wife know hey i'm here to help okay. don't just go in and think that you're going to do it the way that you did it when you left because mm -hmm. things have changed you know your wife or significant other has been holding down that household and it's been fine without you the house didn't burn down wow so when you come home just 
be patient and just allow yourself to slowly get back into it. Um, just don't try to dive back in it because he or she has been doing it and they want to do it together with you again. So here we are again. I just want you both to understand, like you sign up for a life of service by doing things like this, you're still being of service. Oh. And I hope you realize that. I hope the mm -hmm. both of you realize that. Well, sometimes it gives me purpose. Yes. You know, um, I question why I'm here and stuff like that. So lots of times if I could give advice and maybe help somebody else, then, then it gives me a like, okay, that's why, I, that's why I'm here. That's what I did. And to go back to what, what you just said, I remember being the kid as my dad came back from deployments and stuff like that. And we got so used to doing stuff without dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he'd come back and, you know, um, we start doing stuff and he was like, I can, I can do that. I can help and stuff like that. So it's an adjustment for everybody. Yeah. And I, if one bit of advice I give to yeah. the kids and, and the wives is include them. You're not, yeah. you know, there's lots of times my mom had to say, Hey, 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 go tell your dad. Don't come tell me because we'd automatically go to mom because she wow. was there and stuff like Great that. Advice. So we would scoot around dad and she, and she would send us back to dad mm to make sure he you know to include him because we we really got used to doing things without him because he he went to desert storm he went to haiti he went you know and stuff yeah. like that great so there's i want to go back to something you said because kind of like we brush it over we can't brush this over your captors perform surgery on you yes so the iraqis who caught you perform surgery on your ankle. yes that i, I we, did they did they did they give you anesthesia? Were you out? Were you like general like, anesthesia? What I was kind knocked of stress out. is that? that I, like, these people who try to kill me now are doing surgery. Yes, please. They, is, you know, they came in. I think it was a, maybe a little bit five days or so into captivity, and they were like, "You need to have surgery." And I'm thinking, "What the hell are you talking about?" Um, but I was bleeding through my bandages every single day. You know, I was constantly bleeding through the bandages. So I need. I knew I needed something. Um, and they made me sign a release. What? Yeah, what do you mean? I had. I had like to you're sign not going to sue your captors. What do you mean? I am consenting to having medical procedures done. Yes, they made me sign a release. I'd love to see that document. I, I want to yeah, know where yeah. that is. Like that, that needs to and be I, framed my I had to, and they think, and one day I have to give them. They made me write it out. It's not like it was in Arabic and I signed something. I wrote it out myself in English and signed it. What did they have you sent? What was their, what were you clearing them of? I don't know. She, all the, the doctor told me, it says, you need to write out that, you know, you need medical surgery and you said yes. And that's what I said. I'm aware that I need to have surgery. I consent, you know, to have surgery. Shoshana Johnson. That's yeah. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. That's okay. So now are you relieved that they're performing surgery or are you like, uh, they're, I'm done. I'm terrified, but I know I need it. So it I, was I, one I'm of stuck. those decisions where you're like, damned if I do, damned, damned if I you don't. Damn. Like, yes. I yes. just need to get something done. done. So you made the decision based off of what you thought is going to be best, best for you to live the next day. Yes. The best. Wow. The best. I picked the Because I guess if I had said no, they would have just left me alone. But then that's on me if I'm, I'm dying gangrene or whatever. Was there any infection or anything that was starting to set in? Uh, not that you... I can tell, but I'm not. I don't have any medical training. I mean, I did combat medic like a week before we left. Wow. So, I mean, no, I knew how to put on a pressure dressing and nothing like stuff like that. And I knew it was bad because every day they had a little medic dude that came in and changed my bandages up until that point every single day. And they would put iodine on it and then change the bandage. And it was bleeding and it it just looked like raw meat. Wow. So they said, you know, um, we'll come and get you in the night. So it was the three of us, me, uh, Edgar Hernandez and Joseph Hudson. And they came one night, said, you're going to have surgery. Come on. And they put us in the back of a van and drove us to a hospital. Oh, so you went to a hospital from yeah. the prison. Okay. Yeah. They blindfolded us and took us to a hospital. Um, they rolled me in. They said, you're going to have, you know, surgery, general anesthesia. And the doctor thinks he's funny. He was like, first time having surgery in, in, in Baghdad. Yes. And I'm, and he's like making a joke. There was really? some humor behind it. Yes. What? Wow. 
It's and unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'm like, what? And I'm like, okay, I'm in shock. Bombing is going on. The building is vibrating. The windows are taped. So they wouldn't, you know how they wouldn't implode and stuff like that. And I go underneath general anesthesia. And it's open mic night for the surgeon. <laughs> like, I, I, but did, did you look at that like, he's an asshole? Or did you look at it like hey, there's a humanity? There? A little bit of humanity. He was trying to make it, he was trying to lighten it up a little bit to make wow. me feel better. He could have been stone faced the whole time right. if he really wanted to. So I, I just, wow. I, you know, I'm blessed. Um, I woke up and both my legs are bandaged. It hurt like hell. It hurt worse than I remember being shot. But wow. when I was shot, the adrenaline is pumping so hard, you kind of and stuff. And I remember being wheeled out. And then I see Joe and Edgar there. And I was like, are they OK? You know, and they take us back to the prison. Do you, go ahead. you know, what's crazy is, you know, when we first did the the podcast, the, yeah. the, the, the two part, um, this is like this is something that like I'm hearing it now for the first time. Like it's just mind blowing, and I think you know people who have known people that know the story, who guys who were with me during that rescue, they don't know that. Right. Like nobody, nobody that I know knows that, and that that's crazy. People would automatically assume because obviously I'm not the only person in that room to do, doing that rescue. Mm -hmm. So there's other guys throughout the country who have told this story that were on the ground with me. And that's a detail nobody knows. Wow. It's, it's, I'm telling you, I, and that's one of the reasons I questioned them. Like, how did I get so blessed? Why, uh, but why question it? You are. But because, but why? But, you know what? Don't try and figure life out. It'll drive you crazy. You won't have the answers. Here's the thing. To say, I am blessed. What do I do with it now? Yeah, that's, that's another, but, other but side of the, the coin. Thing. Other side of the coin. But here's the thing. I guarantee you, because you've told your story. You have been an inspiration of people. I guarantee you, you have already saved somebody that you have no idea about. And if it was just one, then that's why. I tell you right now, just hearing this story, talking to you this weekend, it's like, it gives me more strength. You know, it gives me, me strength. Absolutely. What? Like, yes. it, it's inspiring. Sure, sure. It really is. Like, just like I said, the wait, way wait, wait, wait. I saw wait, you. You were like the superhero. <laughs> the way it, <laughs> but the way I like saw you superhero. to the way I met you to the way I saw you again yesterday, it's like, wow, like how strong are you? Yes. You know, days that I'm having a bad day for something that doesn't even matter, like what you had to go through during that time. And like, you're here, like hence the two hugs I gave you, like <laughs> you are here. Like that's strong. Like you're a strong woman. Like that's incredible. And one thing I like to tell people, you don't know how strong you are until you have to do it. You think? I th I think but a lot of I, grown men would have folded strong. in that yes, situation. I don't think so. I, I, Absolutely, I don't know how Absolutely. I, I don't know how I would have been in that situation. Hey, Incredible. I, I, I don't, don't want to be a little cheesy here, but this is called unbreakable because not everybody is unbreakable. A lot of people break. You did not. You are unbreakable. Yeah. You came through this other side of this tunnel, and it wasn't always pretty. But you're still here to inspire at least the two of us sitting here, which means you're inspiring other people sitting home. That is unbreakable. That is, I, that's what your purpose is. That's what your blessing is. That's why you're here. So don't question why you're here. Say, thank you, God, that I'm still here. And we thankful. can still do this. I am and I can still inspire and lift up other people. I want you to like be proud of yourself saying, I know I'm affecting people and that's good enough. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I am a survivor. I readily admit yes. I survived. And, and, you know, there were times when I, you know, I just wanted to lay down and give up. Um, but I had to say, I'm like, and there were times I was like, this is it. And then I was like, you know what? I survived the ambush. I can survive this. I survived the, and that's, you know, during the 22 days. But, um, I, I just think that it's within every human being. I think it's within every human being. It's there. You just got to tap into it. Some people don't know where that break right. point is. I, I don't think you really know where your break point is because mm -hmm. Like others would have broke. Yes. <laughs> Wait, is there any? I, I've just read stories of POWs in the past, like Vietnam POWs, who played mind games with themselves to keep themselves going. Is there anything while you were in captivity that you did that a little a little trick you used to keep yourself going? Oh, I planned out my life. I <laughs> and this ain't it. <laughs> um, 
I, you know, at the time I had a two year old daughter, I wanted to have more kids. Um, I saw myself, you know, getting married and living that, you know, that American dream. I have, and I have part of the American dream. I have, you know, my daughter's growing up to be a lovely young woman. She drives me crazy sometimes. Um, <laughs> Which means she's like a normal daughter. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I, I'm blessed enough to be able to um, have a home. Um, I, I was able to live out part of my dream of going to culinary school. So there's aspects that I've done that I'm, you know, very happy with and, and stuff like that. But sometimes I feel I'm still searching for that, that golden purpose, you know, and I test out other things to find out if that's it. Um, I do enjoy speaking. Right. I, I, I enjoy speaking more at home to the younger kids than I do when I have gigs out of town. I, I, I'm a member of the military order of Purple Hearts. Um, and one of our things that we do is we talk to the elementary school kids and sometimes the high school kids and talking to the elementary school kids is what the thing that gets me every time. First of all, you got to prepare yourself. Cause they gonna come out and ask you every damn thing and they want to know every detail and they gonna think of some things that you never thought of before. The hardest, some of the hardest questions I got were some like third graders and fourth graders and I had to go home and take a drink. I had to go home and take a drink. You had no filter. None. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was like, Oh my God. What one kid was asking, you know, if we're the greatest military, how, how you get caught? And I was like, <laughs> what do you say to that? What do you say to that? What do you say? I was like, well, I, I don't, I don't Wait, know. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to get back, but uh, I'm sorry. My ADHD kicking in. Um, so I don't want to lose it. You said you were playing out your life. Oh, in captivity. Activity, so yeah. what do you mean by that? Like, is that like a, a daily thing? Is that, is you, so yeah, it, it, fill me in. It, you're building me. your life. You're going to meet the right guy. You're going to have more kids. You're going to be, you're going to be this big culinary chef. Right. You're going to do this. You're going to, you know, and so stuff. So you were like, envisioning your life past, past right. captivity. Yes, past captivity. What wow. am I going to do when I get home? And, um, you know, stuff like that. You know, I'm going to, you know, see my daughter. Uh, um, I'm going to continue with my military career. I'm good. You know, I'm going to go to the culinary arts team. I'm going to, you know, go to culinary school after. And I thought this, I was going to do, finish out my 20 years. I said, I'm after, you know, so I'm literally planning out my life. It's going to go like this. It's going to go do like this. I'm going, none of it happened like the way I, but also it. getting killed then isn't. Yeah. So that's you, not part of the plan. Replace, right. It's getting killed is not part of the plan. No. That's, that's how you. Yeah. So, so that's what kept you going. That's what, yes. that's what kept kind of the, the mind sane during that time. Yes. Especially my daughter part. I'm going to see her and I'm going to see her grow up. I'm going to see her right. go to college. I'm going to see her get married. I'm going to see, you know, and things like that. So I'm planning out this life, you know, for myself right. for during my captivity. Um, thinking of my family and stuff like that. And then, you know, I, I, I have a belief in God. I had long conversations, you know, with the Lord and, and, you know, all the, all the crap you did as a kid, you apologize, <laughs> terrorizing your sisters. I'm the oldest. So I terrorize right. the hell out of my sisters and stuff like that. Wow. So it is, um, 22 days. I, I, God bless the men that did it years, years. Yeah. years. So, during that time, because I know during my deployments, um, you miss certain foods, right? Like there was a time that, you know, we, we had outran our supply chain and we yeah. didn't have food for around four days. So during that time, you know, we, we were limited on the water that we could drink. So during that time of not eating for the four days, like we come up with this list, you know, like I had this list of you what I- Anything for four days? Uh, nothing. Nothing wow. for four days, you know, and I always Unbelievable, make Unbelievable, right? I always and make, you were supposed to fight. Yes. They oh. did. Yes. Um, I always, you know, during you the- You see how he keeps brushing well, that yeah. off? <laughs> well, you know, it's like, it's like you know, you, as, a, as a kid watching cartoons, Tom and Jerry, and, you know, Tom looks at Jerry as like a big ham bone. Right. Like, that's how you start looking at people. You know? <laughs> uh, but like, during that time of captivity, was there something that like, was, oh, there, was, like, a, was there a food that you're like, I'm yeah. having this when I get home? Because like, this is like- There was two things. First, I wanted a big fat steak, a baked potato, and a beer. That all makes sense, yeah. And then, uh, God bless my grandma, God rest her soul. I wanted my grandma's fish. <laughs> uh, we're from Panama originally, uh, kingfish. Mm -hmm. The way my grandmother fries that fish, and since her passing, none of the aunts my mother can duplicate it. My dad asked me 
what do you want when you get here? I said, Zell going to be there, my grandmother. I, he goes, yeah, of course. I want kingfish. Wow. That fish was fried. I got that fish the night I landed oh, wow, in El really? Paso. Oh, I love that. The night I landed in El Paso. As a matter of fact, they um they made us stay on post because the media was all over the place. My father drove back to the house, went and got my fish and brought me that fish that night. Wow. You see, like that's the thing. Th- those are like the things, Jay, that like on deployments that like you look forward to. Right. So I can only imagine like in captivity, like you're looking forward to something. Something's keeping you going. And like, you know, it's if it's a food or if it's your daughter, or if it's your faith, yeah, it's yeah. just you have to hold on it's to whatever something. it is and just keep like, you know, it tomorrow is going to be better. My time and her time were completely different in that country. Um, but I still had things in my mind to like keep me going to the next day, keep me going to the next day. And uh, so, I was, yeah, I was just curious, like where, where that was. You, like, after you came home and, you know, you had your daughter and stuff like that. And you experience the conflict. I mean, you were the head of the spear. <laughs> you were the head of the spear going into in country. And yet you still stayed. <laughs> you still stayed in the Marine Corps. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd, uh, you know, at the time I, I really like that mission like was with the Iraq war. So like backstory on me. So the, you know, when I joined, the, I joined at a young age, right? 18, 18, the average group, the average age of that military fighting force is like between that 18 and 22 year old. Um, there was things that I wanted to do when I joined the Marine Corps. Um, as a, as a high schooler watching 9-11 happen, I wanted to go to Afghanistan. Like I was, I was angry just like every, every other American, right? I was angry. So I, I knew I was going to join the Marine Corps. I wanted to go to Afghanistan. Um, I say that that plan got derailed a little bit because the Iraq war started kicking off. So we went into Iraq, right? I went back to Iraq a second time. Um, so the things that I wanted to do was go to Afghanistan and I wanted to go on a mew, you know, the, the, I wanted to go on, on ship. So we said Iraq, uh, twice. And then fast forward, you know, some years later, I finally made it into Afghanistan. So I checked off that box of Afghanistan cause I was still like, that was kind of like my bucket list. Um, and I still wanted to go on a mew. So when we got back off of deployment to Af- or, uh, Afghanistan, um, they were looking to stand up a, a platoon to go out on a mew. And I raised my hand, volunteered, and was like, I, like, I want to get on that. So it was a quick turnaround time from when I was back coming off of deployment to right back into another workup cycle to go on that mew. So I was able to check the boxes of things that I wanted to do. So that's kind of what made it a little easier is like, I wanted Afghanistan. I wanted that Mew. So like, that's why I kept doing what I did until I checked the boxes. I got a few more things I want to make sure we get before we go, let you guys, y'all go and hit your flights. But what an incredible weekend it's been so far though. Oh it's yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Um, you told us yesterday, so you knew she was missing, that she was captured. Your family didn't. Oh, the notification. Yeah, yeah. The notification of my family of my POW status was, it was botched. Um, My father found out I was a prisoner of war on a Sunday morning trying to find cartoons for my daughter and turned it to Telemundo and, you know, found out his daughter was a prisoner of war. That's... (laughs) That's, yeah, that's that's insane. That's, that's, that's yeah. crazy because, you know, I know going on deployments, you know, telling my wife prior to leaving on deployment, like, hey, if, if somebody comes dressed in blues, like knocking on the door, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not here anymore. Yeah. Um. So like, I, the whole procedure of how it was done for somebody that's in that's taken POW, like, is somebody coming to knock on your door? Is it a phone call? What's that like? You know, it's... Like a, it's, I think it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, they messed up. So they didn't have that. He so just, he what is watch like you know, what's his reaction? Like yeah, like he and my mom like, was at mass. This can't be real because nobody's at my <laughs> door. This can't be real because we didn't get a phone call. Yeah. Like what, it, what it, my my thoughts? mother was at mass. She's at mass. She yeah, coming home. Yeah, oh she's at God. mass. She comes home and they they're telling me this stuff, and um my mom didn't believe it at first. She was like, no, Claude. And my dad did twenty one years. He deployed the Desert Storm. And um, she goes to work. She go and she works on Fort Bliss. Um, but then you know she ends up coming home, and they're calling. You know they're calling Fort Bliss. They're getting a run around. So they get a babysitter for my my daughter, and they go up there. 
And they were like, oh, okay. And they kind of bring him to a room to inform them and stuff like that. And um, it's actually a chaplain that told them before they go into the room. Yes, it's true and stuff like that. But they had already, everybody had already known. It, it was all over the place by that time. They, you know. How many days into this? It was the same day. It was the same Sunday, but it was hours later. I'm saying the same day you were captured, news broke. broke. It, wasn't, it didn't take a few days. If, no. I rem- if I remember correctly, like looking back at like, you know, video, you know, news footage and stuff like that. They had a few of the American POWs like trying to have them make statements on TV or something they, like they, that. We, right? did, we did interviews. Right. Where, I mean, it was like two hours after being shot and captured. You know, Iraqi TV is putting a microphone in my face talking about what is your name? You know, where are you from? And stuff like that. Big so, propaganda. Well, like, no, they just access those questions. And so then, these are news cameras. Do they, is, 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 I think we're both looking at like, they have you there and hey, you better say this. No, they didn't. Okay, wasn't no, like that. Okay. Nothing like that. They just came and asked me questions. Um, why are you here? Because uh, I'm told to be here. Because I was captured. <laughs> yeah, I'm here because I'm yeah, captured. No, right. Yeah. yeah, why? You know, <laughs> you brought me here. Hey, as a yeah. journalist, that's a terrible question. Why are you here? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm handcuffed and have my ankles blown out. I, You know, and they're, they're asking me and I'm answering, you know, because they're like, why are you here? And I was like, I'm told to be here. You know, it's not like I'm here to invade. I'm like, because this is my job. Mm. What do you, you know, and so forth. It was nothing big, but that's the piece. I guess they started showing across the world right. um, and how my dad, you know. Wow. So I have a similar story. Why similar? I mean, nothing like that. My mother saw me on TV too, but it was news footage of the rescue. So it was Shoshana and myself. So that's how I was seen on TV. Um See, and news I can't being believe broken in a good way to my family that I'm still alive when news is being broken on her family that they don't, you know, who knows what's voice. going on. Yeah. I, and and, I, I want to ask. Oh, go ahead, and that's one of the re- I can't believe you didn't tell them the whole story after your face is yeah. plastered. When I came home, that was the picture. Kearney trying to keep the news cameras out of my face as they're trying to get me onto another transport to get, you know, and stuff like that. And you're gripping his arm. Yes. Right. I must have left a bruise or something. I was gripping hard. But that's the picture. When people ask me about anything about, you know, the prison, that's the picture they have in their head. And they tell me, you know, I just remember that picture of you captured and then you rescued. You captured and then the big rescue mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So I'm like, how did nobody dig deeper? You know, I'm sure the questions were asked and I just uh, kind of avoided them. Um, you know, you, like cause some of that, you know, you're coming off deployments and, you know, kind of get back to the mental health aspect is, uh, you know, I, I didn't really talk about all of it because I, I, at the time, 18 years old, 19 years old, how, how do you process that? You know, how do I process that? And like, I came off that deployment with my friends and we're joking and, oh yeah, I remember this and that. And as we're cracking beers, like that's how we processed right. it was like through alcohol. We didn't really have anybody to talk to about it. You know, they're like, hey, like what you guys went through at this age is it's pretty significant. Right. You know, so I think I just kind of brushed the story or gave little bits and pieces, never really got into detail. For oh. for people who, again, they didn't hear the first podcast we all did at Veterans Day. Uh, with Shoshana Johnson, Kearney Russell, Shoshana here, American POW for 22 days in Iraq. Kearney Russell kicked down the door to rescue her. Um, again, kind of just quickly from both your point of views, that day of the rescue. Um, and you have two t- two different viewpoints. Obviously, you're inside hearing them try to kick the door down. You get word that morning that there are these Americans you can go rescue. So I guess you go first. So I, I want people to hear the actual story of what really happened that day and then your viewpoint in there and then and then we'll get a couple of questions to wrap you guys up all right so yeah that uh that night or you know we had formed task force triple get up there towards saddam's hometown hometown of tikrit my platoon we were responsible for you know securing this bridge the next morning uh i say it was a boring morning morning you know i've said it over and it was kind of you know people think during war it's non-stop you know and there's moments of like the pause in the fight where it's like okay what are we doing now so it was one of those moments um, and, you know, all these rumors circle around throughout the war, weird rumors, right? Like 50 Cent lost his arm on my second deployment. I think J-Lo died on one deployment. So there's these rumors that people just spread. One rumor was that the Army's 3rd Infantry Division is going to come relieve us in place. So 
that morning they're like, hey, battalion command, your so you battalion going commander, home. Yeah, battalion commander wants to talk to you guys. So we're all like, the army's third IDs here. We're leaving, you know, and uh, <laughs> we weren't leaving. We f we found out we were doing that mission. Um, so we go, we go, you know, we load up kind of like ad hoc plan. Like this is what we're going to do on the fly. We're kind of talking about what's going on and get to the wrong house. We're about to, you know, hit the wrong house or hit the house, and we realize wrong house. We start moving through that. Uh, Wait, hey, dude, who who writes up the game plan? Like, you know, again, I'm sitting here football terms, right? You're, is it like done in the car? Is it done? Yeah, before so it? game plan was done just before it. Uh, our platoon commander, uh, company commander, um, had came down and kind of talked about what we were going to do. Uh, Chief Scout got got you know Chris Castro um, kind of came up with the plan. Um, and we were just there to kind of, you know, execute that plan. So we went to the wrong house. Then we wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to do this. In football, you got a game plan. It's a week that you start the plan and right, you practice. How long? So they tell you the plan. Is we, it, they tell you we once probably had like you go? we probably had like five minutes on that just to That's try it. to figure it out. It was quick. And That's quick. it. So they give you a plan in five minutes. You got to figure it out and go. Yeah, because we we that was that was oh we got information God. that we had to act on fast. Okay. Um, if we would have delayed any of that, they could have been moved, you know, they right. could have been moved. So, uh, we come up with the plan really quick. And again, it's, as you're taught, you know, we're taught in the Marine Corps, like, you know, Semper Gumby. So always be flexible. If that plan doesn't work, figure out something else. So the first house we went to, that wasn't it. We had to try to figure out where it was. Uh, so we moved through the town a little bit, figure out where that house is. Um, I was a point man going in, uh, and I, I would say, you know, you watch Hollywood TV, those doors just fly off when somebody kicks it open, right? That's Hollywood. But everything I've ever seen leading up to it led me to believe that you just kick a door and it's going to fly in, it's going to fly open. Didn't happen. So I was the point man. So I remember I kicked the door, nothing happens. And in that quick, like, and like during that quick moment before I made the second kick, I real I was thinking like I'm gonna get shot because now they all know I'm here. Like every gun in that house is gonna be pointed at this door when it comes in. Are people so, also coming outside? Like yeah, we saw like Black Hawk Down. Yeah, so like, people were everywhere, and uh, I always tell the story. You know, I watched Black Hawk Down in high school. Um, I obviously wasn't there, but from what I saw on TV, there was just people all around rooftops and what I saw in real life in Iraq, there was people on every rooftop, you know, imagine, wow. imagine a, a new, a new force is here, you wow. know, is, is here in California, you know, everybody's going to go outside and look to see what's going on. So, you know, get back to the, the, to the door. So the second kick again, nothing happens. And I'm like, I'm getting shot, you know? So when the third kick finally, I was able to get the door open with like the third kick. And I, when I went in, you know, rifle up, kind of flinching, expecting to be shot, didn't get shot. Um, and uh, we found them. <laughs> Immediately, or you have to go sweep. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of like a long hallway, door on the left, door on the right. They were inside of the room on the right. And uh, if I, my memory serves me, um, it's like there was another room just past that that kind of opened up, kind of call it like a living room area, if you, you know, so to say. So they were in that first room on the right. So when I went into that first room, everybody in the stack behind me is reacting different, differently. So we flood that room. Uh, every room pretty much got flooded with Marines. We flood that room dominate that room, you know, tell everybody get down, get down, um, trying to figure out who's who. And then, uh, and then somebody says, Hey, if you're an American stand up. And at that point, the Americans stood up, you know, the seven of them stood up. Um, wow. There may have been a little confusion as to who's who. Uh, so, you know, get back down. I'm like, no, she, she's American. <laughs> but the moment you see her and realize like, wow, we just saved these people. Didn't even process it at the time. Wow. Cause it's, everything's still happening. Like now we found them. Now we have to get them out of there. Everybody's outside looking, you know, the looky loser out. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. Okay. So now we found them. Now we have to get them out of there because that's where they're at right there. It's, 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 they know that is like a danger situation. Right. So we need to get them somewhere safe. So we have to get them out of where they're at, load them up, you know, load them up on the vehicles and just speed through that town. Um, like I said, it, it wasn't just me. There was a bunch of other Marines on the ground behind me. It was a, it was a whole unit that did it, you know, a whole company of Marines that, that accomplished this. Um, so we have to get them to safety, right? Other platoons are tasked with securing routes for us to get out of there. We have contingency plans. If something goes wrong with us, who's going to come in to get us? Um, wow. Yeah. We're able to get them, so get that, them out. It's all right. So that's your, 
That's your out, the, the version from the outside going in. That was my day. <laughs> that was your day. What's the version from the inside going out? Um, well, I remember they, they did just given us breakfast. Um, and then you hear the bang. <laughs> so what was the bang? Him kicking the door? Or? The, the door being kicked really? in. Really? The bang. So you didn't hear any commotion outside? No, or? I didn't hear. I don't remember hearing anything outside. Wow. That I don't remember that at all. I mean, you can ask the guys if you get a chance, but I don't remember hearing anything. All I hear is the bang and I kind of jump and then bang, bang, and then get down, get down. And I'm thinking clear English. I said, that is clear English. I'm going home. And I, I, it was just surreal. I'm going home. And then they were like, get down, get down. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm the American. I'm not getting down. Um, so I stand and one of the guys, Gordon Miller, comes over and pushes my pushes me to the ground. Get down. They put everybody on the d- ground to control the situation. And then they pick up, you know, and stuff like that. And from the moment they said, okay, Americans stand up. And I start to stand and they like, then they're like, okay, they start hustling us out, hustling us out, you know, and, um, are you crying or are you or you're not? No, yet? I'm holding on. I you remember struck. she she, she yeah. could hardly walk at that point. I remember yeah. like I, I remember bringing her out to the vehicle and like having like she could hardly walk. It was kind of wobbly. Yes, very much so. And then they, they had us like crouched in a certain position because they're they're clearing, make sure we're good. Then they're talking about when I give you the word, you're gonna make a word for that vehicle right there. And that's when break. I can't run. <laughs> And I don't know who it was that said, I got you. That was me. It wasn't yeah, you. I, I, I brought you the vehicle. But no. For, yeah. Yeah, dude, oh, oh. It was you. Yeah. I, and oh, then yeah, like, yeah, oh, God. Yeah. I get yeah. out of here. And I like hooked the me. And then yeah. I'm not. Look, I'm not a twig. Wait, that's that's. I didn't I realize mean, it, it was you. Yeah, I think it was, it was me. It may have been another Marine, but I remember specifically walking with you out to the vehicle. I, to the vehicle, because yeah. we got to get you to that vehicle. And I was yeah. like, I can't run. I wasn't, and I, and I started to lose it because I'm like, one of the first things is I don't want anybody to get hurt because I can't carry my own load. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm slowing them down and it causes a problem because there are people, you know, after they're look, you, you see them put like, doing some watching and stuff like that as they're trying to get us so i'm like my thought is i can't let anybody get shot or something because i can't i can't move fast enough that's the worst thing you can ever think i i think probably for you if you can't make you know run up and stuff somebody takes a bullet for you that's not what you want so i start to i that's when i start to break down but they got me to that vehicle quick fat and i'm not light <laughs> even 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 though I lost some pounds in captivity, I'm not light. They got me to that vehicle quick, fast, in a hurry, and I remember us being like stuffed back there and then just moving. And I was like, "Oh my God, I'm going home." It was just so. It was surreal. It's surreal. This whole weekend has been surreal. <laughs> just having you all here. So my final question to you: because we're gonna get you both back on flights. Um, you have not seen her since. You handed her off. You got her on a plane, a helicopter. Yes. Got her to her medical facility, U.S. medical facility in Kuwait, right? And then you went back and and fought more, and you haven't seen her 21 years. Now that you're sitting here seeing her for the first time in 21 years, how does it make you feel? And has she changed your life? What would you like to say to her? Uh, It's it's great to see you. You know, it's amazing. It's it's great. Um, Again, Jay, thank you for this opportunity, right, to bring it to get us both both together. You know, I want to thank you for that. Um, Kept my word. But you know, to like thinking back, I kind of think like, you know, not not was I ready to see you at the time, but like I was still processing other things, and like maybe this is the best time, right? Like I'm more mature about things. you know, I've, I've done, you know, things in life and like, just be able to sit with you and like have an adult conversation. <laughs> right. Cause back then she would have been having a conversation with a 19 year old kid. Mm. You know, I was, I don't know if we would have been relating on <laughs> much, you know? So I, I think this is, you know, why did we wait so long? Why has it been so, so long? long? Um, I don't know. This yeah. is the perfect, I think it's been the perfect weekend, the perfect, you know, yeah. opportunity for us. Um, and I would just say, like, I don't want to wait another 20 years to see you. No, no, no. I'll be getting your address. I'll be mailing cookies. That's my favorite <laughs> thing. I love mailing out my cookies and stuff like that. It's been, it's been, 
I don't, I don't know how to describe it because like I, I keep on seeing the 19 year old. So to see you develop into this grown ass man who raised a 20 year old, raising another baby, more deployments. It, 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 I, I mean, it's hard to put it in the word. There's a sense of pride there to see what you have become from that moment, that young man who was just, and you were really focused on your job to see you mature to this man. And I think you need to get into some speaking and stuff for yourself because you are very eloquent in the way you speak and the way you handle yourself. You can inspire a lot of people. And not only, I think you could not in, just inspire them from your experience, but maybe steer a lot of young men into the right direction mm -hmm. of how they should handle things. Um, and especially in sense, in the way of being a father. You know, sometimes uh, uh, you get boggled down by what you couldn't do instead of realizing what you can do and being able to talk to you, um, hear about, you know, raising your girls from then and then now that young lady now, um, I think you can help a lot of young men, especially military young men, you know, move forward and raise kids and stuff like that. So. Um, there's a sense of pride of the, of the man you have become. Thank you. Very much so. Um, but it is surreal. And, and damn, bro. <laughs> <laughs> damn. It's been really wonderful weekend. And I appreciate you doing that, doing this and everything. You know, things happen in life. And, and sometimes you want to do something. And, you know, life happens. And you don't get to do it. And I appreciate the fact that you kept insisting. And I get the text message and said, what about this date? What about that date? What, you know, because people live life. And, and you kept going. It's appreciated. It's appreciated. I gave my word. Yeah. Not just that, Jay, but, uh, you know, just not just when you, when you gave us your word and followed through, like that just shows the guy that you are. Yeah. But to take a step above that is, you know, the text messages yes. on the side about stuff and, you know, just like genuine guy who, you know, we met through a mutual friend, friend and like, yes. you know, we're building a friendship of our own and it's not yeah. just, Hey, come do this podcast. Thank you guys. And I'll see you yes. later. It was, yes. it was, it was, you know, it's the follow up, and, you know, I feel like, if I need to reach out, uh, you'll, you'll respond back. And so, you know what, thank too, you. Because, like, I do think mm -hmm. God gave me the, 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 the blessed me with the ability to communicate. And I have a, a, a platform and a form to be able to communicate. But I got to learn from people like you. So when I learn from you and I have that voice to give it out there, I, I'm i honored to be teammates with the two of you where I can learn from you. And I do, I've learned so much from the two of you. From the last time we talked and the time we talked on MVP to – just sitting here in person, I do feel feel like we have our own little team now that we're going to be able to lift each other uh, and inspire each other, but also continue to lift and inspire the world. So Absolutely. I, I thank you both for making the time to come out here with me. And um, I appreciate you guys allowing me the honor of keeping my word to you, which is really important. And I think the best thing for me is just when I saw you guys double hug yesterday. It's pretty damn special. It so is. with that... We're going to oh, sign off. I'm going to give you something. Okay. Military Order to Purple Heart. I am a member. Uh, 393 in El Paso, Texas. From us to you. Thank that you. military yep. thing. Thank For you. For the support of our military community, we thank you. Thank you. We thank you. Can I give you a hug too? Here sure. We go. <laughs> oh, heels. Here we go. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank the you, ultimate Chris. survivor. Thank you very right much. Here. And one's for you Johnson. too, Kearney, because... Curdy you didn't get shot. <laughs> uh, get shot. Shoshana, Curdy, guys, thank you so much. Thank this you. has been the Unbreakable Mental Wealth Podcast, the greatest podcast episode we have ever had by far. Oh, my thank goodness. You, Love you guys.